All right. Cool. All right. Well, uh, morning, everyone. Uh, Thursday. Hope you all are doing well out there in uh, quarantine land. Um, and yeah, okay, so a couple things. Uh, actually, there's updates on all the assignments. Um, so on the uh, Web of Trust assignment, it, I'm sorry for some of you that I maybe gave an accidental uh, heart attack and additional stress to. Um, so I there was a bug in my grading script and it missed a whole bunch of your submissions, so they weren't included in there. Uh, so yes, I know uh, right away that there's a problem when I got 20, 25 emails. Uh, no, it wasn't certain users. It was um, it was just a I don't know. It was a bug in my grading script that it wasn't picking up your um, uh, and it wasn't importing it into my local key ring where I have everybody's stuff. So then when I went to go create it, your um, all your signatures you submitted were not on there. Uh, I'm not really sure why exactly that happened. Uh, it's kind of a baffling bug for me, but uh, anyways, we fixed it, uh, regraded, and got that all um, sorted out. So I apologize for that. Um, the other interesting thing that came up with that, of course, we got more signatures, which means we got more scams. So there's actually a person who um, got 27 uh, signatures on their adversarial key. So congratulations to that anonymous person that was actually the winner. Um, yeah, so that was uh, pretty impressive. That's roughly, I mean, less than, but it's still not that much when you think about it, right? We have about 350 people in the class, and so that's even less than 10% of the class. So um, that's, you know, for as, uh, for as, as high as that sounds in terms of scamming, you actually all did a great job of uh, either detecting that or and uh, being vigilant. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, assignment five. Uh, so I wanted to discuss this a little bit. There's something funny. Actually, another bug that happened here a little bit. Um, did anybody... So I know some of you did the uh, extra credit part of assignment five. Uh, how many... Did any people in, this, in the um, chat attempt assignment five, the extra credit? Yeah, so some people got it. A lot of people tried it. Um, for the people that tried it, one of the most difficult things is that it um, there was no intelligence given about what the distribution of the key was. Um, the funny thing that I want to share with you is that it actually turns out there was a... Usually the distribution there is, um, I don't know, much, it's pretty difficult and that um, I haven't had people... I think only a few people have actually done it in the past. Um, what happened was when I was creating the grade scope version, I actually had a bug and I duplicated the line from part four. So it was actually the exact same as distribution as part four. So it was only five character, I think lowercase or something like that. Um, it wasn't lower, it wasn't all lowercase, but it was five characters, right? It was uppercase and numbers. Yeah. So that was uh, not exactly what I wanted, <laughs> but uh, so it's funny. I was thinking about it. It's a, interesting way of when you have no intelligence about what the distribution of the key space is, it makes it actually much more difficult to even approach the assignment, right? Because if you knew that exact key space, you could easily search through that. Um, I'm not going to say what I'm going for because maybe I'll use it in the future, but definitely more than that. So no, everyone does not get extra credit. That's not how that works. <laughs> it still fits within the spirit of it because um, everyone didn't know what the distribution was. So um, yeah, it just happened to be easier than I thought it was going to be. So uh, that I thought was pretty funny. Cool. Uh, okay. So then uh, now uh, on to new assignment, assignment six. So this is actually, uh, before I start, I guess, this is one of my favorite assignments, and I hope you'll find it uh, pretty cool too. This is essentially the culmination of all of our... Um, uh, this is the culmination of all of the things that we've been talking about here. So we're going to put into play, uh, and you're actually going to do basically hacking of binaries and um, other types of things. So this is going to combine everything we've learned and done with um, uh, the bandit levels. So the bandit levels will come in super handy here. Um, you'll be reversing stuff. Yeah, all kinds of, how do I, there we go. Okay. 
uh, all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, you actually have a lot of time on this assignment, but I urge you, these are kind of like puzzles and challenges. So it's very difficult to keep them all for the end. So please start early on this assignment. Um, it's due on uh, May 1st. And we're not going to do any late submissions because finals week is the week after that. So I want everyone to just like focus on this assignment and then the assignment can be done and then you can focus uh, just on the, the final. Um, and so the um, so the goal, so you're going to be breaking a number of levels. Yes, this is going to be the last assignment. Um, and so I'll show you, we'll walk through this. Actually, I'll do it right now. Um, bum, 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 bum. Let's go here. Let's go here. Cool. So, uh, what you'll do is you'll all be given. Um, so, assignment six is currently live on the site, but you don't have any way to start it yet because you don't have a username password. So, I'll be providing that with you uh, later today. Um, very uh so stick with me on that okay so when you get all set up you'll ssh uh, into this machine and uh, from here uh, you'll notice so it's just an ubuntu 18.04 so this is kind of why we went over those bandit levels so you know how to interact with this know how to access this on the command line um, and what will happen is uh, so inside the directory uh, ls-la var challenge. So in the directory var challenge, you'll see a number of different challenges. So there are these are essentially different challenges that you have to break. So um, for in so um, and let's see, yeah. So let's look at one of these. So essentially. So if we look, and this is where it gets into um, um, the why set UID is important. So essentially, the way this all works under the covers is in each of these levels here under challenge, there is some kind of executable that is here. We can see it's set group ID executable, the S bit on the group execute, and this means that it runs with the privileges of the just dash execute dash me group, um, and so we have handy tools. Uh, there's a utility called score that when you run this will output um, who's solved what on which level. So this shows you this is kind of like a cool leaderboard that you'll see people um, moving up as they play the game. And uh, the goal is so I'll show you I'll even tell you how to uh, break the first level called just execute me which uh, spoiler alert all you have to do is just execute it. So you do this, it says, whoop, congratulations, you broke this level. Adding you to the group, just execute me. And so if I run the score now, I'll see that I have uh, I have a check mark under just execute me. Um, so there you go, that's how we break this first. Yeah, this is the easy one. Uh, there'll be a more difficult one. Um, it gets more difficult, let's see. And okay, some other tools you need. So. There's a program, if we look, uh, a program called Leet. So this program, the idea is if you trick, so um, you have to, when you break this level, so if you think about it here, right, we have this just execute me that um, challenge. So essentially what this is doing is the way I know that I've broken this level is because it adds me to the group just dash execute dash me. Um, but so if I control this binary, I can get it to do whatever I want. Um, and so what I want to have it do is to execute this command leet user local bin leet because that will add me to the level. So the entire point of this leet command is to help you when doing this. Um, so once you break one of these levels and you're operating as that group, this leet command adds you to that group forever. And that's how you actually count it as your points. So. Uh, it'll depend. Let's actually look at uh, object dump dash d. 
actually can't remember what this does. Let's look at it, the main function. Yeah, so uh, it's calling exec VE, uh, which is execute with some stuff. And if we run strings on it, I'm sure we'll see what it does. Yeah, user local bin leet. And so if we run it with uh, strace, we can see the system calls that it writes. Uh, so here we can see that it's calling, if we go to the very top, 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 uh, execute. Okay, so this is basically all that just execute me does is call um, user local bin leet. Uh, that's all it does. So it executes that command. So this is essentially, so if, let's say for instance, uh, some of the challenges will call it for you, and that's why when you break it, you'll get that um, get the level. If it doesn't call it, then you'll have to force it to call that. So that's with um, using some of the vulnerabilities we'll talk about. So the idea is you, you, we actually haven't covered all the things that's necessary to break all the levels. We'll do this as we work through the, um, the binary hacking, uh, the application security slides. Uh, but start it now. There is plenty of things to work on and to start on now. Um, so it's super important. Okay, cool. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so that'll be good. Um, there's a list of tools here. So if you don't know these tools, um, I highly encourage you to uh, check them out. Um, Object Jump, GDB, Ltrace, Strace, um, Wireshark is what we talked about, the network tool. SCP is very handy to copy files from your local machine to the server or from the server to your local machine so you can analyze them that way. Um, let's see, okay, so uh, let's see, answering some of the questions. Um, yeah, you'll get the username password combo later today. So I'll make a post on Piazza of how to do that and where to get it from. Um, ba -ba -bum. Yes, you can change the passwords that you get. Um, that's totally fine. Recommendations on which ones to start. Um, yes, we are still having a final. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, okay. So evaluation. So each, so the entire assignment is essentially out of 100 points. Each level is worth 12 points with a maximum of 105 points that you can earn from breaking levels. So I'll let you do the math on that, but essentially it means uh, if you break all 10 levels, you would get 105 points. Now, there is another extra credit. So this is actually just a tool to incentivize you to start early on this assignment. Um, and so if you finish five levels, just roughly 60% um, uh, of the assignment, is that right? Um, by the 24th, so basically a week before the deadline, you'll get an additional 10 points on the assignment. Um, and this stacks with the previous one. So this means total, the maximum points you can receive on assignment is 115 out of 100. Cool. And then uh, submission instructions. So submit, uh, basically, if you write any kind of code or anything, just like we've done in previous assignments, Submit that along with a readme, and the readme is really important here because we want to understand that you know how to break these levels. So submit a readme file that has your name, your ASU ID, and some description of how you broke each of the levels. Um, and so there'll be a grade scope assignment where you can submit this, and we'll see that there. Uh, there is a bug bounty on this server, so I'm giving you permission. If you manage to get uh, root, which means you have privileges of the root user, then you'll get uh, 50 additional points. So I will say the reason why this is here and not part of the extra credit is because this is a not intended thing. It's a bug bounty. So it is, um, no, it's never, well, uh, I'll tell you a story in a second. So um, yeah, so it's not intentional, but if you happen, if you, uh, it, does happen, I want you to tell me about it and you'll get 50 points so that I can fix it. Um, I'll tell you, so I borrowed the concept of this assignment from uh, Giovanni Vigna, who is a professor at UCSB. 
And when I was an undergrad taking undergraduate security course, he had an assignment like this. He had a very similar bug bounty uh, thing. And actually the very first thing, um, uh, the very first thing that I did was figure out what uh, Linux version it was. I found that it was vulnerable. I downloaded an exploit and got root on it basically immediately. Um, I mean, if you have the ability to get root, you should be able to get the rest of the points very easy as well. So that's kind of on you. Um, so anyways, I, I've seen it done in the past. Nobody has done it in any of these assignments. I like to think I'm more careful in setting these things up, but hey, who knows? So uh, it's more there to encourage me to make sure that all the stuff is secure. But if it's not, I want you to take advantage of this and uh, get all the points. Uh, any questions overall on the assignment? Cool. All right. This should be fun. And now, let's see. Done with this. Done with that. Why is this in the way? When should you start for maximum efficiency? Honestly, as soon as possible. That's like the, um, because there you can get it's easy to get kind of stuck on some things so you want to um you want to make sure you start early i think that's going to be the the best uh way to go um we'll discuss the final exam later i want us to focus on this and then we have um on we have an in-class ctf on uh, next thursday so i think that's the 16th is that right yeah so we'll talk about the ctf on tuesday Oh, well, these I'm telling you, I've seen students fail because they start this late and because of the nature of the assignment. It's not like a coding assignment that you can just crank out in one day. Uh, it's very possible to get stuck on these things. And so you need a uh, different, uh, you'll, I'll tell you this, uh, once the assignment gets up, it's, uh, it's, it'll become clear which is, which levels are easiest and what things to start with. So I don't feel like I need to give you that information. It will definitely come up organically with uh, the list of users. Oh, there will be, and that's on them. So, you know, you're all adults. If you want to procrastinate, that's on you. Uh, like I said, we'll talk about the CTF stuff on Tuesday. Cool. Now let's move on. We're going to talk about x86. Okay, got that. Good. Cool. Okay, so back to assembly. Um, so to refresh our memory, there are uh, what we're kind of focusing on here is how do applications um, and how does how does a program that's compiled from a high level language like C, how, what is that assembly language that the CPU actually executes? Um, how does that that happen? Um, And so we've looked at how memory operations work. So how to move uh, data from a register to another register, how to move data from memory into a register and from a register back out of memory. Um, there's a number of other operations. So there's move exchange. Uh, we'll definitely go a lot into push and pop. Uh, those come up a ton. Uh, there's also types of ways of doing um, all our fun binary arithmetic, adding, subtracting, multiplying, division, uh, increment, decrement, and also all the logical operators that we're familiar with. We have ands, ors, xors, nots, uh, all those things that we would expect. Um, we also have, just like in normal um, programming languages, I actually don't know the difference between idiv and div. Uh, you'd have to look it up. Yeah, a lot of these things, I don't know exactly what the semantics are, but they're all very precisely well-defined. So. If you look up uh, x86 idiv, it will tell you exactly the semantics of what that means. Um, then the other thing we need is, so when we talk about, oh, maybe immediate, that kind of makes sense. Um, 
I don't know. If somebody looks it up, just link it in the chat. Um, so um, we also need the ability to kind of alter the control of the application. So when we talk about control, what are we actually talking about here? Anyone? Okay, IDiv and div is signed and uns unsigned. Yeah, so the control, controlling the flow of the program, right? The control flow of the program, what things execute, right? It's almost second nature at this point, but when we write some uh, line of code, like if um, uh, foo is equal to 10, oops, bum bum. Then print, uh, hello. Wow, okay, this is not going great. Um, else print goodbye. So, um, so, you know, roughly here, right, where the control, what instructions get executed changes based on this value, right? So we need some way of doing that in um, in assembly language as well. So we have a various types of things. We have things, um, jump is an unconditional jump that just says go, to, go here. It's kind of like a uh, go to statement. Um, call and return are gonna come up a ton. We're gonna definitely go over this. This is how, um, essentially we're gonna pull apart the covers and understand, well, when I call it this function print, how does that actually happen? And how does the CPU know, know to go back and where to go back to? Um, int and iret are interrupt handlers. Um, we're not gonna get into that a ton, but we can also do things. So these are kind of uh, what we call, um, so these are maybe unconditional transfers. So whenever this line of code or this assembly executes, always jump to this other instruction, whereas we have other types of conditional jumps. So for this, we'd say, well, jump if uh, not equal, jump if equal, jump if, I can't remember what AE means, jump if greater than or equal, I think. Um, and the other thing is we can have control flow that is direct. So where it says, we say, hey, uh, if this is not equal, jump exactly to this point in the program. Um, otherwise, we can actually have indirect transfers. So this says, hey, if this um, jump, if not zero to wherever is in this register. Um, and then kind of other miscellaneous things, some input output instructions and a NOP or a no operation instruction. Uh, so why would we want something like a no operation instruction? It kind of seems silly. Why would we want something that does nothing? Yeah, so actually on some CPUs, we um, we actually need a NOP after a jump statement because of pipelining, which is kind of crazy. Uh, we may want to delay certain operations. Yeah, different kinds of reasons. So uh, there are actually legitimate reasons why you need this. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, if we go back to kind of our diagram, right? Um, we're not gonna get, you know, you can take and you will be taking an operating systems course that will go into all the kind of concepts of an operating systems and what it does. Uh, EAX is a register. So this is the register EAX. Um, and so if we think about, we talked about, right, our app, our application is running kind of on the processor. And essentially, and this is kind of the very nice thing that we've built up from programming. So you guys have all written, you know, applications that have done stuff. Have you ever had to worry about um, talking to a hard drive? So the hard drive, right? Uh, it's kind of a crappy hard drive, but it's connected to your computer, right? It's uh, HDD. It has a spinning disk. It has, uh, it speaks, what is the protocol, SATA, I think? No, it must be, it's some other thing. Um, uh, 
Uh, SATA is the connection. There's a protocol that it talks to it, right? So there's different, there's hard drives, there's uh, SSDs, and those are actually different and can have different things. Your hard drive can be rated. No, rate is different. It's on top of hard drives. Um, man, I can't remember that protocol. Uh, I cannot remember what it is, but uh, NVMe, is that it? Okay, we'll go with that for now. SCSI, I think, is different too. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Okay. Cool. Let's, uh, so the, somebody has to tell the, um, hard drive, Hey, get this data at this sector, right? So when you're reading and writing files, uh, what's actually happening, right? So in computer science and throughout all of computing, we've essentially created these beautiful abstraction layers. So your application doesn't have to say, okay, if this is a hard drive connected to it, then issue this command to the hard drive. If it's a floppy disk, do this command. If it's a, um, if it's an SSD, do a different command because that's more, uh, that has better performance. If it's a um, flash drive, use a different type of command. And so we've created this layer where how do you read and write files in your app in C? No, that's C++. Yeah, okay, so I'll allow it. So open, read, and write are one way. There's other ways, as we'll see. These are um, kind of wrappers around different things. But anyways, so you can call these different... Uh, functions like open so open a file read from a file write to a file and what's actually happening is there's a bunch of logic that's happening in your operating system that handles all of this complexity of how do I actually talk to this hardware device but your app doesn't have to deal with any of that complexity and so the way this happens, we need some kind of mechanism for your application because if you remember, your application is essentially running on the CPU and things are executing. So we need a way to signal to the operating system, hey, um, I would like to open a file for reading. And then, hey, I would like to read uh, 20 bytes from this file that you opened for me. Or I would like to write 20 bytes to this file that you opened for me. Um, I think there's close. Similar things happen with networking like we talked about, right? This is actually the beautiful thing of why our applications don't have to deal with the TCP three-way handshake because the operating system does it for us. All we ask the operating system is, hey, I'd like to make a TCP connection to this IP address on this port, and then the operating system itself will take care of everything. Um, and so in order to make this whole thing happen, in order to make that these calls happen, um, we need a way for applications to talk to the operating system. And these are through system calls. And this is how um, your application talks to the OS. So on and the tricky thing is this varies a little bit depending on uh, the exact architecture and depending on the operating system itself. Yes, we are only focusing on 32-bit in this section. 100%. So what we're doing is, so now uh, when we want to ask the operating system to do something for us, we invoke a system call that our libraries will actually invoke for us. But on Linux, what we do is we have an interrupt 80. So it's int means interrupt. Uh, 80 is just by convention, the interrupt that says, um, hey, I want to, the application wants to make a system call to the OS. And then the EAX register contains what system call number we want to make. So, um, so we can actually use this to write our own, and I guess we'll do this right now. I think this could be fun. Um, we're going to, we can write quickly our own hello world application, a hundred percent in assembly. So, um, we'd look up, let's see, I have this. Uh, we'd look up uh, Linux x86 system call numbers. Um, oh, why does this look so ugly? Uh, 
All right, so we can see like uh, right is he uh, hex four in the EAX register. And then the other parameters to write, the file descriptor to read and write from is an EBX, the buffer to read and write from is an ECX, and the number of bytes to read is an EDX. Uh, so we can see kind of all of this, and we can see there's actually a ton, right? There's uh, over 337 possible system calls that can be called uh, in Linux, which is kind of crazy. But we don't need um, all, of, all of this for now. This is just to show you where you can get this information from. Uh, also, this is exactly how computers work. So if you want to understand security, you need to understand explicitly what's going on. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, so we can walk through this code. Uh, let's try it. Uh, SSH. Go on my server here. Um, Three sixty five. Okay, so uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I don't have Emacs, that's great. All right, I'll install this very quickly. And cool. Okay, so we have a uh, we have a dat, dot data section, and we're gonna make a uh, the hello world string. So we're saying we want a string somewhere in memory called hello space world slash n uh, a dot text segment. Now we're saying um, that our main we're gonna have a uh, main main label here that we want to be global so when we compile this everyone can see it uh, so we can actually go through let's look at this we'll look at up here oops that's not what I want oh that's cool it put you up there okay and the very cool thing is you can use man pages to look at the uh, manual here is this not uh, is it difficult to read the text yeah. Okay. How's this? Better? Okay. Well, now I have to use Vim, so thanks. Um, okay. So if we look at what this system call is, this is a uh, system call where we're writing to a file descriptor. Um, so we're writing to a file descriptor from a buffer that we have a number of bytes. So one of the really important things to understand is by default, the three file descriptors that are always open for every process in Linux. So you have um, standard input is file descriptor zero, standard output is file descriptor one, and standard error is file descriptor two. So if you just wanna write to um, hello, right to so essentially what we're going to try to do is uh, what we want to call is essentially write to file descriptor one to standard output uh, the string hello world slash n and we want to write how many bytes is that one two three four five six seven, eight, twelve I could have cheated and looked at the slides. Uh, this is essentially what we're going to try to be doing. So how can we actually accomplish this? So then we can look at our syscall table. This is really small. There we go. Uh, let's see. We can look here. We can say, OK, right. So I need to first move dollar uh, sign four into EAX. So this is the way that I uh, specify. Uh, nope, we will look at this in a second. We're actually gonna debug this. Uh, it's gonna be great. So uh, we're gonna move four into EAX, which we know here because this says the system call number is four. We're then gonna move uh, one into EBX. So we're going to move one into the file descriptor. So we're gonna write to file descriptor one. We're gonna move now, uh, dollar sign HW. So what this is gonna do 
is the compiler, when we assemble this into binary, it's gonna put this string somewhere and then we'll see it's gonna move the address of that string into the, the register ECX, which we need for this. And now we're gonna move uh, 12 into EDX. Uh, we need to call an int uh, 0x80 and then at this point it should write out hello world. And then now we're, because we're very nice uh, people, we're going to exit cleanly. So if we look here, wait, it should be one. Oh, that's interesting. Has this been wrong for a long time? Move one, uh, dollar sign, EAX. Oh, okay, no, 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 that makes sense, okay. And return. So we're gonna return from this function. So whoever calls us, um, we'll look at this later, but EAX, whatever's inside EAX when a function returns is the return value. So if we write this out, and let's see, will this just compile? Oh, cool. Okay, and saw a bunch of packages because apparently we don't have all the things here. So, okay, while this is happening, I will answer the question. So the other beautiful thing that um, the operating system provides is even though an application is essentially executing on our CPU, uh, the operating system has uh, created such protections that it should not be able to take down the whole OS. Um, so that even if the app, no matter what it does, because if you remember, you'll have different applications running on your operating system. So the operating system needs to do super cool things like deciding how much CPU time each process gets. So it's constantly switching between them. Also, you wouldn't want it that one application is able to crash or take down the other one. So there's protections in place there. Um, so now we can look and we can see we have now an a.out file. We can run it. So we run it, we see that it says hello world is exactly what we wanted. Uh, we can use a very cool tool. This is what I showed uh, earlier. So strace is a system call tracer. It uses a debugging trace to output all of the system calls that this binary makes. Um, so there's actually a lot of stuff that has to happen because you're, um, it's loading up all the libraries and everything. But we can see as we get to Huh, it says stat one, why doesn't it say, I would have thought it would have said right. Okay, but let's uh, debug it now. Um, so now we can just use, uh, let's see, do I even have GDB? No. Okay, install GDB. Okay. Yeah, we can do a few things here. So we can debug uh, a.out. I'm gonna put a breakpoint on main. Uh, there's a great uh, GDB. Uh, GDB actually has an amazing manual that has all kinds of stuff of how it works, what kind of things it does and can do, this user manual. Um, really everything you can learn about uh, debugging with GDB is in here, it's amazing. Um, so what I'm going to do, I set a breakpoint on main. Uh, so the B is breakpoint. I'm now going to run the program with run. Um, and if you're used to GDB, you'll see, you'll try to do something like L to list the source code. But here we're actually debugging um, assembly code. So what I want to look at, so what I'm using is examine. And then I'm telling it I want you to interpret what I'm giving you as instructions, and you're gonna do 20 of them, and it's gonna be a dollar sign EAX. So now we can see in memory, and this is super cool. So we're seeing exactly the layout of memory that things are. So here at main, exactly at 4004D6, we have our instructions, and these are almost exactly the instructions that we wrote. We have move four into EAX, move one into EBX. Now our move hardware, uh, this line, our move hardware into ECX has been replaced with this. So let's look what is at X, uh, XSS. 
So if I look there, I see at this memory location currently inside of our program are the bytes H-E-L-L-O, and I can actually uh, 12, is it C? Yeah, so this is outputting each of the bytes. So this is examining the exact same memory location. This interprets it as a string, and this interprets it as, show me 12 characters in hex, so at the byte level. So here it's showing me 48, and if you look up in an ASCII table, 48 would be capital H, 65 is lowercase e, uh, 6C, 6C, L, L, O, space, W, O, R, L, D, new line. Um, so we can see these bytes are in memory, and when GCC compiled our assembly to this ELF file, it told it to load up these bytes of hello world slash N at that specific location. Um, so then we can use ni to go to the next line. Um, that's weird. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay. Uh, Okay, let's kill this real quick. The problem is I didn't put dash M32. And of course, I don't have all those libraries installed. Okay, that's fine. All right. Okay, yeah, this is because I, uh, that makes sense, uh, because I didn't uh, compile it as 32-bit. Um, so I can single step instruction, so go instruction by instruction. I can do ni to do next instruction to step over function calls. So let's single step, um, RIP. I can see, so I previously moved four into EAX. I can, uh, I can do info registers to, print out the value of all the registers. So I can see in RAX, I have four in there. Um, and my next instruction is going to be move one into EBX. Step instruction, I can show my registers. I have one in EBX. Um, and then my next instruction is gonna move that hardware value into ECX. And then we can see ECX has the value of our string. We're then gonna move 12 into ED, uh, R, uh, EDX, and then we're gonna do in 80, which will print out hello world, and then we'll return. Um, as you can see, so the GDB interface is not great. Uh, GF, GDB. Actually, usually on my machine set up, there's tons of different uh, configuration things you can use to make GDB better for debugging. I really like, especially binary debugging. Um, I've got used to this thing. Uh, bu -bu -bu. So let's install this and see how this changes. So now, if I go a little bit bigger. So now it actually shows me a very nice output. It's showing me at the top uh, all of my registers. Uh, RAX. Man, I really want to get rid of these. Um, and it shows me exactly where I am in the binary. So I can single step the instructions and I see that all of this uh, updates as I'm doing this. Cool. Um, yeah, there's other stuff you can use uh, for, there's other like reverse engineering specifics. I really like this one. It's, it's pretty nice. It shows you a lot of cool information and shows you when, so like for instance, RCX, it knows that this memory address is, can point to something and it just figured out that this is a string. It actually shows you the legend here that says this is some string. Uh, these are stack locations, heap locations, all kinds of stuff. Um, cool. And I need to, oh, I should do this on the other machine. Okay, that's fine for now. Um, cool. So yeah, this is kind of the, the brief over uh, look into how system calls work. 
um, how we can actually write assembly code that can do stuff. And this actually happens all the time. So normally in a, if you wanted to, uh, uh, normally in some function you would say, uh, in main, this is not valid, but you'd maybe say printf, something like this, right? Well, what's happening is printf is a library that is a function inside libc. And if we figured out, uh, oh, I need the, there we go. Uh, so in the, this library provides this printf function, but under the covers printf does a lot of work and then eventually calls write just like this. So this is why typically <clears throat> when you write C code, you're talking to a library that does the system call for you so that you have a nicer interface. But this is actually all that's happening under the covers is these things get translated in your library down to these system calls. Cool. All right. Okay. So, okay, so we did that. So now, so we've seen we can compile this. Uh, we can look at the file format here. We can see it's an ELF file. And you know what I'm sick of looking at? Uh, the 64-bit versions. I'm going to copy this. We're going to go to bump. All right, uh, GCC-M32. There we go, now we have a 32-bit binary, so we can see that it's an ELF file, it's 32 bits. Um, now I wonder if I S-trace it. Yeah, perfect, okay, that should have been my first sign that something was wrong. So here I can see in this right system call that it is uh, writing to this hello world. So that's cool. That works exactly as I would want it to. S trace showing you exactly what system calls are being called. Um, and, and now I can kind of step through here. We'll see that the, the instructions changed, um, but now I can do things like use the EIP register, which is what I thought I was doing anyways. Okay, cool. Okay, so now as we saw, right, and this is kind of an important um, concept to understand in your mind and to think about is what do, like what, so if we look, right, remember this a.out file is just a file on disk, right? It's just bytes that are sitting on the disk. It's actually not different from any other file like this hello-s file, right? There's all There's no difference there. The difference is that um, a.out is in a format where the operating system knows how to take those uh, bits and bytes in the file, put them into memory, and then start executing. So then I, when I run dot slash a.out, it executes that program for me. Um, so, and you can actually look, uh, we're not going to get super into it, but if you look at the uh, proc file system has a lot of information so ls uh, proc self uh, let's see we're looking at maps so if you look at this file you can see hmm, why can't i scroll uh, there we go so we can see that this bin cat is at various memory addresses and exactly kind of what those look like, what's going on here. Um, and so basically this ELF file gets loaded into memory. The operating system lays it out exactly how it shows it here. It maybe does some relocation, which we won't talk about right now. Um, and then it sets the CPU instruction pointer at the start address that we saw in the ELF file. So if we do uh, read ELF, uh, S 
and da, 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 we can see the entry point address at 3C0. So that's what it sets as the entry point, and then it starts executing. OK, so a uh, couple things. So we're going to talk about kind of how the memory is laid out in a process. This actually becomes all this stuff is all intricately tied together when we understand if an adversary has arbitrary um, the ability to, to write into memory of a process, what kind of things can it do and how does that work and how does specifically the layout work? So the very first thing that you'll notice is in this class, whenever we draw memory layout, uh, we're going to be drawing it with high memory at the top and low memory at the bottom. So that's in all of these uh, types of examples. We will always have high memory at top. So this would be in 32 bits. So we talked about it. The highest memory address will be all Fs. So F, 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 F. And the lowest memory address will be all zeros. Um, again, this is a, another super cool thing that operating systems provide to applications. Uh, if you think about it, so this application can technically talk to most uh, effectively, you know, two to the 32, this whole memory range. Um, but you could have multiple apps that all think they're talking to this whole memory range. And uh, the operating system manages this in, with virtual memory in such a way that they actually think they have different views of what memory looks like. Uh, so the operating system does super cool lies to the system. Um, okay. Now, Cool. So when we write a program like, uh, yeah, I do have Emacs. OK, except you said Emacs was ugly. So if I make a little test.c file, um, OK, so what's a typical main function? What, what are my arguments that I can have here? Anyone? Arc C. And I just did some stupid Vim thing and overwrote it. Cool. Um, int arc C, character, pointer, pointer. Oh, God. Uh, oh, there we go. Wow. Uh, arg v and actually there's another argument that you can put there that most people don't worry about which is the environment pointer um, and then I could do things like let's say printf uh, percent c percent d arg c so I'm going to print out what arg c is I'm going to maybe print f uh, da, 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 percent s slash n arg v zero. And let's just do envp zero. See what that outputs. And because I'm a good person, I'm going to return zero. So I can compile. Uh, we're going to compile this again, 32 bit. So that compiled. So if I run this, I can see, uh, let's see. So arg c was one. Um, arg v zero was dot slash a dot out. And this was envp zero. Uh, now if I add foo bar here, three is arg c, a zero is still a dot out. And this environment pointer is this. So let's debug this. Oh, I want to install Jeff again because that's much easier to deal with here. OK. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, stuff happens. Okay, so we have now our first call to printf. So one of the cool things here. So one of the cool things here about Jeff, you can see it's telling us uh, printf is printing out the first argument is a pointer to that string percent %d slash n with argument of one. Um, and uh, we can step over the, ah, shoot. Okay, next instruction. So the printf will print out one, and then this next, uh, I guess it compiles it down to a puts. Okay, this is uh, not great for this. So let's, oh, because it's a constant string. Yeah, that makes sense, okay. So, nope, don't want you, don't want you. And boom. Okay. So. Cool. Um, so when we execute this program, right? So the important thing to remember is when we do a dot out, we're actually not doing anything, right? What we're doing is we're asking our shell, in this case bash, hey, I would like to execute dot slash a dot out, and then it will execute it. And if we type in any extra parameters, we want it to pass that to the program. But how does this actually happen, right? So this data needs to get from essentially our command line or really from bash into this. So um, what actually happens is it all comes down to exec VE. So if we look up syscall reference, so exec VE is a system call, right? So the other thing that a program can't just do by itself is execute another program. It actually has to talk to the operating system. And this makes total sense because we talked about um, access control and everything else that the operating system has to do, the permission model, everything like that. And how is that enforced? Well, it's enforced because applications can't execute things themselves. They need to ask the operating system with by calling exec VE. So how do you do that? You pass in the path name, and then you pass in a um, string pointer argv, which I believe its last argument is null. That's how it knows how many arguments are there. And then a pointer to the environment. And essentially what happens is all this data gets passed into your program. The number of arguments is passed in as argc. Um, argv is what's essentially passed in here and the environment pointer is passed in for you to use. Um, so there's a ton of stuff here, but Eventually, essentially everything eventually calls exec VE and then your operating system has to then create the process. So when it takes your program and executes it, it needs to be able to pass that data. So it first passes in all of your, uh, so your environment variable, all of your argument strings are actually in memory. This will definitely come up when we talk about uh, how we can use these things to exploit buffer overflow vulnerabilities. Um, we have pointers to them, we then have argc, and then we have a section of the program called the stack. So why do why do programs need varying amounts of memory? So, or another way to put this is, do programs need a fixed static amount of memory? And maybe what are some examples? So what kind of program doesn't need a fixed amount of memory? <laughs> Chrome, yeah, that's a good example. But why? Why is Chrome not a, uh, why does Chrome need a dynamic amount of memory? Yeah, we need more because we may be reading unknown user input. For Chrome, we're going to a web page and we're visiting it. We don't know how much data it's going to uh, send to us. So we need the ability to use different amounts of memory. Uh, as we'll see, um, the stack is used for function calls and that'll be super important. So essentially the way we're always going to draw the stack, and this is again, the stack grows from high addresses to low. So it's always going to grow down. Um, and then we have some shared libraries, other stuff. And then we have another type of data that's the heap that grows up. So uh, we'll see different ways of how this works, but the heap essentially uh, you can think of when we need to allocate, like when you call um, uh, malloc or free in C, this allocates memory on the heap that's used for you. Um, when you do, what's the C++ equivalent? Is it new and delete? Is that uh, the equivalent, I believe? Um, 
yeah, that's allocating things on the heap. And so that way that allows your memory to grow in a different kind of manner. Um, and then you have your data sections. And then finally you need your text section, your actual code. So this is kind of roughly the layout of how memory looks uh, to your applications. And so it's kind of nice. You have this nice uh, dichotomy where your stack, you have two different types of data uh, memory areas that can grow. You have your stack that grows down towards lower memory and the heap that's growing up. Uh, so they can each grow in that direction. Um, cool. Okay. So we've actually looked at this a lot. So we've looked at disassembly a ton. Uh, so disassembly is this notion and this idea that we want to be able to take those raw bytes. So if we look, uh, right, if we look at hex dump, this is actually the bytes that are inside that a dot out file. So some of it at the top is this is all probably elf header stuff that we don't need to worry about. Um, but this stuff in here is actual code. And unless you're, I guess, so well versed in this, you can look at this and see the matrix for what it is. Um, really, we need something that can decode this for us. So we need some kind of process. And if you think about it, what we're talking about here is we originally had a C file that we, um, So we took a C file to assembly, and then we'll just call it a, like an object file, or maybe ah, we'll call it an EXE for right now, like a binary. Um, so you can think of this maybe as like compiled, and this is uh, assembled. Right, and so one way to think about this, and this is where this term comes from. So this is kind of the forward engineering process, right? As you make something, you have a C file, it's compiled to assembly and then assembled to an executable. Uh, part of what we're doing is kind of a reverse engineering process where now we have an executable. Uh, we need to go to the assembly through a disassembler. And then we need, and then a uh, great thing to do would be to be able to go back and go here to a decompiler. Um, P yeah, sorry, this is... Uh... And so as we'll see, uh, disassemblers are essentially trivial and easy. They're, they're fairly easy, I'd say, not uh, trivial. Um, so we saw that with object dump, right? I can use uh, object obj dump a dot out oh i need to say dash d disassemble everything and here it's trying to interpret everything as bytes so if i look here at this main function i can see okay here's the code that the compiler generated that corresponded to my program remember this was the prints and the printfs and stuff um, so here i can learn and understand what this program is doing by using a disassembler to look at that. So I'll talk about different types of things. Um, so there's actually tons of types of tools. I'm gonna point you to some stuff right now. So um, Radaware is a, um, a disassembly tool. It has all kinds of reversing and vulnerability analysis. Uh, it has really good scripting capabilities. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's a uh, more of type of a command line tool similar to like GDB style, but much uh, better. Um, I will say uh, Ida Pro is kind of the state of the art tool for reversing. I actually don't think I even have it here. Um, it supports disassembly of binary programs, but it also supports decompilation. So it has a decompiler that tries to decompile assembly code to C code. Um, this cost, well, the current hex rays uh, basically cost like $10,000 uh, $10, for one license, uh, usually to do one type of assembly language. So if you wanted to support different things like x86, x86-64, ARM, um, each of these costs roughly in the order of $10,000. Um, so this kind of shows how in some sense special purpose these tools are, but in other ways... Um, uh, how, but they do have a, uh, version that's available for free. So you can check that out. Uh, you can check out Ida pro. It is currently, 
um, considered kind of the the state of the art or one of the best tools for doing this. Um, Hopper is one that I used to use. It's a disassembler that has a decompiler that's not great. It's roughly $100. Uh, super cool, this is kind of a new uh, thing, is Ghidra. So Ghidra is an open source reverse engineering suite that the NSA actually um, released. So this is actually super cool. You can check it out. It's written in Java. It's um, uh, relatively inexpensive, right? So when you're talking about a $10,000 tool or a couple thousand dollars, $90 is a little bit less. So Ghidra is pretty cool. Um, it has a lot of the ability to do a lot of different architectures. Uh, let's see, I do have installed right now. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy that a.out file from the server locally. So SCP is a secure copy from this server and this is the file I want to dot locally. So this should copy it here. Um, and then I think I have, there's another product called the Binary Ninja that also has a, a free version to use. Um, I guess I haven't ran it in a while. And so just, just to show you kind of roughly what these things look like. So if I go here, temp a.out. Um, so what this has done is it shows me, uh, this is at the start location. So this is kind of a standard uh, libc of things that happen at the start. I have the symbols over here of all the symbols it's pulled from my binary. I can go look at main. And where's my nice, um, and I'm still getting used to this, so I don't use it a ton. Oh, there is no graph. Okay, lols. Um, but let's see, cool things here. Okay, one thing you'll know, the syntax is different, right? So it's, it's uh, default is Intel syntax. Um, cool thing is, let's see, I can look, here I can double click, I can see, oh, yeah, printf, uh, ta -da, ta -da. this should show me, yeah, so you can so kind of see here on the screen, I can't show it with my cursor, but you can see this is showing me the data location at that point, and we have the bytes 25640A, so that's actually percent %d, new line, and then a null byte. So this is what's getting passed into my printf. Um, cool thing is you can do things like, so here I have cross-reference. So here, this shows me everything that calls puts. So if I'm trying to debug like a large program, let's actually, uh, I don't know how useful this will be, but here's a something I was looking at for a CTF challenge. Um, no, I want main. There we go, okay. Now you can see more the the power, at least here. So here is kind of, so now what it's doing is it's showing me the graph. So each of these blocks is essentially what we call a basic block, so it has no jumps in it. Um, but here, so for instance, um, yeah, here we go. So here's something where it's doing some code, it's getting something from the user probably F gets, and then it has two branches. So you can see two branches here. If this condition is false, it goes this branch. If it's true, it loops back to itself. Um, so this gives you kind of a high level overview of the graph kind of of this, this program and what it's doing. And the super cool thing is like you, you know, here are functions, oftentimes in the compilation process, the names of functions, the names of variables, these type of things go away as it's compiled. But I can do things like uh, call this main loop and then it will update that so i can see what are all the references of main loop i can see it's figured out it has different uh, arguments uh maybe this is the fd i don't know so i can um uh, name different arguments i can figure out kind of what's going on and you can see here when it's able to determine that the thing that it's pointing to is a string it actually shows you it here in the output so there's just kind of one example here of this um, I will say I'm definitely not, if you want to learn more about uh, reversing, you should talk to Dr. Fish Wang. He is, uh, no joke, probably one of the best like reverse engineers ever. Um, he's debugged bugs in Windows kernel itself that cause slowdowns of his computer. So 
he is able to like reverse engineer and understand um, the Windows kernel. I don't know if he covers it in any classes. You'd have to talk to him um, or ask him about that. But uh, yeah, cool. Okay, so that object dump is kind of the the standard thing. Um, I you know I will say you don't need any of these fancy tools, especially for these challenges. It's nice to be able to um, to do that and talk about that. Uh, but you can get pretty far with just object dumping a file and seeing what's going on. Cool. Okay, where are we? Um, cool. So as we saw, so kind of if you think about it right, and the reason why all these skills are important is if you think about like software that you care about or systems that you care about, oftentimes all that you have is the executable, right? For something like, um, uh, let's say PowerPoint or Windows, right? All you have is the executable. So we want to maybe understand how it works as far as reverse engineering. Uh, we need to be able to use these tools in order to understand um, how it works. Uh, but also, that's not the only tool. So like we saw, debugging is actually incredibly useful to either understand what's going on or identify bugs in a program. Um, so it's really important part of reverse engineering. So you can think of like disassembling. We look at it statically to see what's happening. We can also debug a running program in order to understand it. Uh, so debugging is an incredibly important part. Uh, like we saw, GDB, uh, I didn't even go into half of the power of GDB. Um, one of the super cool things is its ability to do to script it. So you can, um, for instance, like if you're reverse engineering a binary and it's doing some kind of maybe hard coded password check, you can write a GDB script that every time it hits a breakpoint, it prints out a certain value in memory and then continues. And this allows you to do really cool like runtime behavior analysis of what's going on. Uh, GDB has like amazing. I highly recommend uh, learning about it and using it for debugging. Um, like we said, there's other types of extensions and stuff. Uh, we actually already saw that, so that's great. Cool. That's actually a good place to stop here uh, because when we get here, we'll talk uh, on Tuesday, we'll then talk about different ways to attack ident general ways of identifying vulnerabilities, and then we'll start getting into actual vulnerabilities and how to exploit them. Cool. Uh, I guess we do have a minute. Any questions? Or are we good? We'll talk about finals uh, as we get closer. Yeah, assignment six will be released. CTF we'll talk about on Tuesday. Yeah, the grade scope for assignment six will go up later today. But you only need that to submit, so. Uh, username passwords will be given later today. And so yeah, keep an eye on Piazza. So I'm not sure I'm not sure exactly how the mechanism that I'm gonna send you the passwords are. So we'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about more on uh, the CTF on Tuesday. Uh, no, it'll be in groups, but we'll get into more details on Tuesday. Cool. Yes, you can set up public key authentication for assignment six. That's highly recommended. Cool. All right. See you guys. Stay safe.